Hi, everyone. Welcome to this case study on Penguin Random House Canada's audiobook program. I am Zelina Alvey. I'm the Marketing Communications Manager at BookNet Canada. Um, it is my pleasure today to just ask a lot of questions, essentially, of these two very accomplished people next to me um, about their program. So I will introduce them now. Here we have Marian Garner. She is a veteran of Canadian publishing. Over her vast career, she has worked many places doing many things. But her 25 years at Penguin Random House Canada sum up things nicely. She began her time at Random House Canada as a sales representative, eventually bringing her sales experience over to publishing in the position of publisher of Vintage Canada. Following an internal merger, her leadership expanded to include all formats, not just paperbacks, as associate publisher for Knopf Random House Canada, where she was engaged with books from acquisition through publication and promotion. Since the merger of Penguin and Random House, Marion's responsibilities as deputy publisher have come to include the inception and launch of the audiobook publishing program and overseeing the adult second format publishing program in addition to her operational oversight for the entire Canadian publishing program at Penguin Random House Canada. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got to go. And some how you have time to be here. Yeah. So on the other side, we have Anne Jansen, uh, who joined PRHC in 2017 to create a Made in Canada audiobook program. The audio team has already produced more than 100 titles, many recorded in an in-house studio launched in early 2018. Before switching to publishing, Anne worked at the CBC, where she led the launch of CBC Books Online and produced Canada Reads through its transition from a pre-taped radio show to a months-long months campaign and multi-platform live program. And also produced the book reading show Between the Covers, commissioned fiction and poetry from acclaimed and emerging writers, and directed award-winning radio plays such as The Handmaid's Tale. So. So, I think we should jump right in because I feel like I have a thousand questions. Um, you do. Right? <laughs> So let's start by discussing, um, kind of retracing our steps, I think, back to the launch of your audiobooks program about a year and a half ago now. So starting with you, Marion, mm -hmm. um, can you give us some background on what the company's approach to audiobooks was before 2017? Um, in a word, it was negligent, um, mostly because there wasn't really a viable market in Canada for audiobooks. Um, especially predating the digital opportunities. It just wasn't economically sound for us to be producing physical audios for our Canadian publishing program. Um, that said, we have historically always distributed our US um, colleagues' physical and digital audios into Canada. Mm -hmm. um, but we just couldn't make it work financially mm -hmm. just for a small Canadian market. Uh, so as you work towards launching this program, like what were those first few years like where you decided, yes, we will do this now? Well, I wouldn't say they were years. They were months. months. Yes. Um, prior to hiring Anne, I think we were actively researching and looking into things for about six to eight months. And um, we had the enormous benefit of having our neighbors to the south at Penguin Random House who have a very established program and a very established market um, to help guide us on how to set things up, who to talk to, what sort of jobs we needed to fill early on. Um, and also our UK colleagues were very helpful in, in early conversations and then even having some people visit to help visit studios, outside studios, so we could get our first books going. Nice. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on like the factors that you <coughs> considered in terms of um, the strengths of audiobooks as it relates to your company, or the we potential weaknesses, or the like what threats there might have been? Well, I think that the impetus was certainly the announcement of retail opportunities specific to Canada, that um, audible.ca was launching, Kobo was launching an audiobooks platform, alongside seeing double-digit sales growth in the more established markets like the US and the UK. Um, and also, I think the stabilization of devices that there, we no longer need a specific device for certain things like e-readers. We can, we can use one device. It's one-stop shopping. So mm -hmm. I think the commitment came out of those three things and knowing this format was just going to blossom. Mm -hmm. 
And I know I can speak to our research from around then where every, everyone started seeing um, the potential there mm -hmm. for sure. So it didn't require much internal buy-in. Absolutely not. It was a top-down priority right when we started talking about it. Nice. Yeah. Um, so then Anne was then brought on to lead production. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what those early conversations were like when you first started talking about what your goals would be, what the challenges would be? I think we just sort of threw ourselves into the colas <laughs> bolas to a certain extent. I mean, we were, um, Marion, as she says, had already done some legwork and others had found some studios. It was actually one thing in production by the time I arrived. but. We had some studio connections. We had our actor agreement already set up, which is a, a vitally important part of it. So really, it was going to be quickly trying to figure out how many interesting, great books we could do as we were coming up to our fall big hour. I can now say hour. At the beginning, I was always saying some other. Anyway, but uh, the big fall season. And could we start fairly quickly putting out some books simultaneously with print publications? So we were looking at the big titles for the fall um, and some very recent summer titles. We were working with studios in Toronto, uh, private studios, but also across the country. Um, Pauline Dakin, uh, Run, Hide, Repeat, her memoir. She happens to work uh, at a university at Dell, I guess, in the journalism program. So she helped us get the studio there to make that happen. Then we needed somebody to direct to make sure that you know all of it sounded all right. So finding directors, studios, uh, engineers. Some had done a little bit of audiobook pr production for um, foreign clients, but m for most people, it was a, a brand new kind of pioneering thing. So we just you know built some cabins and inhabited them quite quickly. <laughs> um, it just you know it was really exciting actually. It was really very exciting to find um, this new opportunity. Actors were were, were leaning in. Actor was very excited, um, but every you know people who were coming through our doors uh, in, in, into the studios. Most of them had never read an audiobook before. They didn't realize it was that long a marathon in some cases. We also had authors do, do readings, um, especially performative uh, author, uh, authors, people who are in, in the public, whether they're musicians or, or actors or whatever it is that they're writing about that they could tell their own stories. And again, I think, um, Marin, you always stress just how long it would take for them to do an <laughs> audiobook so they wouldn't be too shocked when they come in. We still occasionally get we got a note back from an author who shall not be named where it was like, well, here are the days that we can record on that you said you were available. And the author returned saying, I'd like this one day. It's like, no, that won't actually work. I think Jessica may be nodding at this very moment. So just finding out how to make it all happen. Um, a lot of talented people across the country have been doing a lot of different kinds of work that kind of dovetailed. I could go on, but it was just a lot of fun. Yeah, there, there are a lot of the specific logistical things I'd like to come back to later. Okay. So it was a lot of like very practical, like just figuring out how to actually just make these. Who, what, where, when, why, how. OK, interesting. Um, and how did you decide which exact titles you were going to launch with? So there were so 17 audiobook titles, including prize-winning Canadian authors, already on sale with a number of titles ready to release when you launched, including David Chiriandi's brother and All We Leave Behind by Carol Off. So, mm. How do you like? How did you decide from all these authors that you have access to who's gonna who you're gonna launch with? I look straight at Marion. <laughs> <laughs> well, for the first season, it was really a scramble. It was what can we actually do feasibly, but also capitalizing on some of those names that Anne mentioned, like having Carol Off read her own book as a radio mm -hmm. voice, um, allowed us, I think, to get some more attention for the book and for her. Um, we had Ken Dryden reading his book, um, Carl Subban, um, brother we knew had foreign rights sales so that we could potentially sell our files if we produced the master. Um, the, we did get a lot of coverage in our first season, um, surprisingly, across the fall list, as well as being able to buy master files from um, other English language publishers that where we might share those titles. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so how did you, I'm curious um, about how you integrated yourselves with the rest of the company, how all that, how all those pieces worked um, in terms of working with other departments um, and sh while ensuring that like you had the audio version of Frontless Titles um, being prioritized and released alongside other formats. And I'm curious if you would call, you would have called your approach like an audio first or an audio two approach. Uh, how simultaneous was everything? How are you working with other teams? Um, I would say definitely audio too. Um, the, the process is pretty integrated up until the moment that um, the pages are turned over for production, which I'll let Anne speak to. But um, 
we're fully integrated. We all attend the launch, the launches, the seasonal launches. Um, start thinking about priorities. Start thinking about whether they should be author read. And this is how far out are our launches? Eight months from when we sell books. <laughs> um, somebody answer. <laughs> In the but it's yeah, yeah we're we're on track as though we're launching our books simultaneously which we are in the mm -hmm. audiobooks for the most part so yeah so you start thinking about all those audiobook considerations as soon as like the project is a go yeah um, can you talk, tell me a little bit more about what the actual workflow looks like from I guess when you start off at the same place with all the other um, teams doing like the print edition and the e edition all the way to like Distribution. That, that's a, I know that's a very long workflow yeah. to walk us through. Well, it's not, like I said, the, up until the time that our team can get the actual pages that we're going to record from, we're pretty much mirroring what they're doing and, and waiting, right? Like, yeah. And also making other audio books while we're waiting don't for Don't just sit around like this. That's true. Um, think, yeah. So we, the books are launched, our, the various managing editors within our imprints will set up all the details in our system. Um, we talk about casting, where we're doing things. Mm -hmm. As much as we can plan ahead, we will. And then we're dependent, as I say, on when those final pages that we can record from are turned over to us. And then it becomes very squishy. And then, <laughs> meanwhile, people are selling and making marketing plans. So you can yes. so, describe the squishy part. <laughs> well, before we get to the squishy part, we do usually have first pages or something where we can think about casting, if we are casting, mm -hmm. and we start to get information about, you know, will this be a doorstop or will it be a slight but very powerful book, etc. Um, so we have a bit of a sense of where things need to happen and when we're casting and so on. And as soon as we can, we get our... Um, hands on a draft that we at least know what the voice of the book is, whether it's you know going to be author read or whatever, we get information, we talk with the editors, give us a background on you know this author, this story, tell us what's going on, and start getting them excited as much as possible, certainly to get the ed editors involved in the conversation. Then we get introduced to the authors, and I think Jessica said the same, your author is your best uh, ally even when it's casting because they are, are involved and they know the voice of the book in their own way. We, you know, we know it is as, as how it's going to turn into an audio book. But the, the tricky part for us is that final pages to um, release can be a fairly tight period. That's a squishy bit where <laughs> sometimes we do go in with second pages or something, which is an earlier draft, knowing that we're going to have to track changes very, very carefully. In the same way that the editors and the proofreaders and the copy editors are making sure that everything gets changed so it's, you know, it's prime self, it's optimal self as a book. Same with the um, audio. So if we do go in with not final pages, we then have to uh, watch out for what's going to change. We get things into studio, the editing, the polishing, the vetting and listening back. We call it QC. Um, I think you called it auditor auditors, which I think was nice. Um, and you know, to try and get it to the vendors on time. And the first year it was tricky because who knew you have to do it that quickly before Christmas things like that, right? So whatever those logistics are, getting things there. But we have, I think, Carol Off might have been our first simultaneous uh, publication, and I think we've hit the mark on since then. Almost everything. Yeah. And it is, we're getting the books almost at the, in some cases, I think in a huge percentage of cases at the same time that the book's actually going to the printer. So um, it is a very tight timeline because we're doing the same thing again except for the audio version of the book, we have to have it Still do a lot of proofed and mm -hmm. quality controlled. And so tight as in like weeks? Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Six yeah. to eight. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, going off something else you mentioned, so even if the author isn't necessarily the narrator, they're very involved in the audio version? Yeah, I think we do really? take a lot of pride in having a conversation first. What kind of thing are you looking at? It's good to know, is an author, uh, author really familiar with audiobooks and has very strong opinions? Um, I think Marion first described it to me, it's kind of like the cover, like you want to um, have a sense mm -hmm. of what the author feels, but you know what a cover should be in the sense of you know your mark and so on. So we have those conversations. We do use a casting director much of the time, although sometimes we're casting from uh, people we worked with before. Um, and then we do almost always uh, have a chance to run voices by the, by the author. So we might send three auditions 
uh, maybe it's one if it just seems to have knocked out of the park and see. Sometimes we've gone back and forth. We've called uh, somebody who's done a self-tape in for an actual in-studio audition just because we want to make sure it's a very big book, there's a lot of complexity, how is it going to work, etc., etc. But the author, so far, either they haven't told us or they've loved it. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good? Yes, yes, first year and a half. <laughs> So I'd love to talk a little bit about your um, in-house studio that I mentioned before. Um, so you launched that in early 2018. Can you tell me how and why you decided that building your own studio would be a valuable investment for the program? Um, purely because of our commitment to the program, so point A. B, absolutely financial, um, that it made more sense to have us using our own facility as much as possible, which is not 100% of the time, um, versus paying studio rental fees and things like that. And also the flexibility of scheduling, like having the control over, 100% control over the schedule rather than having to rely on when outside studios <coughs> might be available for us. We still have to use them, absolutely, but um, those were certainly factors. Mm -hmm. And it, it is a studio that hums along. Caleb is taking an odd day off to be here. Uh, that's our audio engineer over there. Hi, hi Caleb. Um, but yeah, we are in there day in, day out. If it's not main recordings, it's pickups, it's, it's uh, scheduling time for auditions. It's really, really uh, kept, kept hopping. Oh, yeah? I, I mean, maybe no one else is interested in this at all, but like, what is the actual physical studio like? Like, what is your actual setup? Is it this big? It, like, oh, no. What is in there? <laughs> no, no, no. Let's see. Is it actually just a closet? <clears throat> no, it's not a closet, okay. but it's, it's not this big. It's in between. Bigger than a closet and smaller <laughs> okay. than this room. Yes. Um, it's a fairly small space for the control room where the engineer and the director sit. Uh, it's, you know, you have to get along. There's a slightly <laughs> bigger space. We, we bought a whisper room, which is kind of a pre-built studio that you can drop in mm -hmm. and then soundproof even more. When Caleb came along, he made it even better. Um, but there's enough space. I know I went to New York to visit our colleagues and, and went to various studios in New York and one narrator just whispered to me, whatever you do, make sure that people can stretch their legs this far out. You know? <laughs> so you can definitely stretch your legs. You can waltz around a little bit in our studio. Okay. And like, I don't know, like when, like when someone's recording like an album and they have like that, that big brown big thing that they stopper. use. Yeah. If we've got, we use those yeah. if necessary. Cool. <laughs> um, so in terms of the other steps, like editing, um, I guess not just uh, recording, but uh, editing and distribution, how much, in terms of maybe a ratio, how much are you hiring out for and how much do you have in-house at this point? Um, we do very little editing in-house. We do most of our editing and post-production out of house just because of um, logistics, when things need to be done. Editing can be very time consuming. We've been doing what we call roll record, which means that there's a lot of finessing of the editing after, after the record. There are other ways of doing it for sure. Um, but yeah, no, we do not have a coterie of editors at this point. We have a couple of freelance editors that we, that Caleb has been working with in training, so we are trying to develop some uh, capacity for people who work directly with us, but it's, it's early days for that. I mean, I think we've kind of um, cracked the code for the studio, for the performers, directors, all those sorts of things. Post-production, I think, is the, is the next frontier. Okay, room to grow. Mm -hmm. um, so you said your studio is being used a lot constant activity in there. Just curious, is that being shared with your podcast, to any podcast teams? Like how much overlap is there? Hmm. Any? That we're not using, they're not using our studio, okay. yeah. um, which is not to say they're not allowed to. It's just too busy. If, uh, there's a lot uh, of audio books. If they TV. ask permission and it's free, they can, but. Yeah. <laughs> just out of curiosity. <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, I mean, the sound requirements are somewhat different in terms of podcasts. It, um, okay. Yeah, that, you know, the pristine, don't interrupt with the listener understanding that this is kind of a special imaginative space or kind of a, you know, t storytelling space. It's quite different in podcasts generally. It can be. I mean, I'm not saying that podcasts have bad sound, but they <laughs> have a different kind of approach to sound. It's usually a couple people talking. Mm -hmm. It can be different sound effects, different things. Okay, good to know. Um, so, yeah, let's move on to more... Uh, more about the talent mm -hmm. part of it. Um, so you've talked a little bit about uh, the authors that you've worked with and Actra, I think you mentioned. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you're um, choosing that talent, about the pool of talent that's available to you, particularly in Canada, 
Um, have you found it uh, has grown since um, like the desire for homegrown Canadian audiobooks has grown just in the industry at large in the last couple of years? Um, yeah, I can start there. I think it has for sure. I remember a few, a few years ago when ACTRA started a voice committee because they started realizing that these were opportunities, but the radio code at the time was very restrictive and digital sales were really hampered and so on. So they were trying to figure out, and I think they've been very open to figuring this out. Um, and so they've been doing developmental work, uh, also ECW, and we've, we've partnered on not a, not a casting session, but a kind of let's get some voices on tape. We work with a casting, uh, freelance casting director because so many of our books have very, very particular kinds of voices that you want to make sure that you have a good variety. Um, and then it's really just who matches the story beautifully and you could lis imagine listening to them for up to 10 or more hours depending on, on the story. Um, and we've been excited to have some multi-voice books lately. That's been really fun to have different voices and imagine how they will uh, bounce off each other. Um, and as I said at the beginning, most people hadn't read an audiobook. Sometimes now we do have somebody who's read some for ECW or other publishers and <clears throat> probably vice versa at this point. Um, so people are getting into it more and more. It's not for every actor. It, it is so script heavy. It is a lot of uh, articulation, obviously, a lot of clarity. Some people are really, really good at reading ahead. They're kind of like Wayne Gretzky's and they can see what's coming while they're actually speaking and the, you know where the puck is going as well as where it is. Um, and so it just depends a lot. We've sort of, you know, a little bit of trial and error, but auditions and having people back when they've knocked it out of the park for sure. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? I think it was a... Yes. Okay, good. Um, so in terms of working with the author as the narrator, do you always give them that option first? Do you ever... Is it ever a bad idea to ask them? Like, when do you have the author? <laughs> How do you make that decision? <laughs> Sometimes it's really obvious. The person has done a lot of performance, has a great voice. You can, they've been in front of a mic a ton in their life. Uh, it all comes together very smoothly. <clears throat> sometimes an author would like to read, and I think, again, uh, sometimes they listen to some editions and go, oh, I see what you mean about lifting it off the page. You know, you may have an author with a beautiful voice, but can they notice things? Can they actually give that language its, its intention? Can they find the characters if it's, if it's, if it's fiction? So we have sometimes audition um, authors. Uh, recently, um, a book where we thought we were going to have a cast, but the, I was talking to the author on the phone, and she had a great voice. I said, well, just put a couple of pages down, and you know, so I'll have something to check against when it comes to the auditions. And when I heard it, I thought, this one's really great. And when you can get the author to do it, and she was as good as you know, some um, actors in terms of clarity and not too many pickups and everything. So if the author can do it, and if it's a memoir, or if it makes a lot of sense, we have occasionally had authors read their own books that are fiction. Elizabeth Hay read uh, Late Nights on Air. T um, Tamron Mem was read by Anita Rabadami. So occasionally, if they've got a beautiful voice or a background, but in general, sometimes we audition the author without them really realizing. Sometimes they come into the studio <laughs> and they listen to some other auditions. Um, often the authors uh, realize pretty quickly if it's not, they're not the best person. And often with fiction, especially with different characters and so on. But even sometimes with a memoir, if somebody can lift it and inhabit it, with a really fine actor, you can find a lot mm -hmm. in the text. Yeah, we. There were quite a few things at Ebercraft the other day, actually, about how many specific like things that those voice actors do that you don't even realize they're doing in terms of like emphasizing certain words and knowing how to um, use certain accents or you know the pacing and everything. Like, it's a real specific talent. Yeah. yeah, like we all do know how to breathe, but if you had to <laughs> breathe for hours and hours while saying words out loud using your mouth. Looking at a page, it's a lot of talent in mm -hmm. some cases. But some authors, I mean, you know, I mean, Life on the Ground Floor, James Maslick, I think, he just did a beautiful job. He was mm -hmm. a really natural reader, and he just, you know, told the stories if he was just telling a story. Um, so it depends on the person. Mm -hmm. And also, when we hire actors, they don't have a tendency to edit the book oh, yeah. um, <laughs> while they're reading it, That's as it's point. because it's in final pages is problematic. So. And sometimes they say, who wrote this? <laughs> <laughs> It was you. Yeah, the editors often get calls saying, I just was reading my audio book and I'd like to change on page 23 and, four, and it's like, no. This is not an editing time. You let time. that go. <laughs> um, so actually, I was just reading about um, something about PRH in the US developing some kind of like IMDB for voice talent called AHAB. Kind of springing this on you, I didn't warn you about this. Um, <laughs> about um, kind of like a something called Ahab that they would maybe be rolling out and like sharing with other um, PRH companies. Do you know anything about that? Do you know if you'll sure. have access to using wanna... that or anything? Yeah, I'll take it, uh, that question. I, so Ahab, 
the search for the great white whale, which is pretty funny as a name for casting. Um, they, in the States, have Penguin Random House and many other publishers have really direct relationships with actors often. So they would uh, go straight to an author, an actor, even if it's somebody who's got an agent, and they will still, of course, pay through ACTRA uh, or their uh, equivalent, which is SAG-AFTRA, the union. Um, but people in the States and in other territories have done often so many audiobooks. Like I was sitting in on a speed dating with audiobook narrators and audiobook publishers in New York a couple of weeks ago, and somebody would walk in and say, I've done 150 audiobooks, I've mostly done romance, but I, le I love listening to books like Sapiens, I'm, I have a science background, I could do this and that, and the audiobook publishers are listening going, okay, we're not going to just peg you there, we're going to, but I, we don't have people who walk in and say, I've done 150 audiobooks, uh, it just doesn't happen yet in Canada. So with Ahab, what people do is they put up their voice demos. They can say if they've read, you know, 60 audiobooks, 150, whatever, and they can put on samples. So we'll get there at some point in this kind of uh, um, way of people uh, responding. A lot of people who put uh, material on Ahab probably have home studios as well, which is more of a thing in the States. So um, that's a very big way for people to find actors. It's um, just at a different stage, I think, than we are. And so, you know, looking to the future, all things are possible. Right, Marion? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Everything. Yes, I <laughs> Great. So um, let's talk a little bit about the audiobooks that you're actively producing or planning to produce. Um, in terms of prioritization, how do you decide which titles are going to get the audio treatment? I assume you have quite a few titles to choose from. <laughs> um, how, like, how do you balance front list, back list? Like, how do you know which ones you're going to do for the season? Well, right now, um, when we I'm looking at all of 2019 for our adult um, publishing program minus cookbooks, um, we're pretty significantly covered for having simultaneous audio releases between what we're going to be able to produce um, and originate and titles that we share, like I referenced earlier, where we have access to other English language files. Mm -hmm. um, we're probably close to 85 to 90% covered for our front list adult publishing this year. Um, we dip in and out of kids right now, and that's an area that we need to expand on, but it's um, the adult front list is certainly the biggest market right now. And then in terms of backlist, we are being selective as much as we can. We want to create moments around backlist as much as possible. So for example, in reference, Liz Hay, um, Miriam Taves, Anita Rabadami, Michael Crummy coming this fall. We're building the backlist in anticipation of a new front list title. So if an author mm -hmm. has a new book so that there's a moment that we can capitalize publicity and marketing-wise on. Um, and then experimenting a bit with um, some categories and backlist as well. So um, looking deep into our nonfiction, more sort of businessy self-help okay. categories that we see working in other places. And also we're starting, it's not entirely backlist because it's, it's only been out for a year, but we're starting some poetry this year with actually one deep backlist title um, and a, her frontlist title with Dion Brand. So just dabbling in some different categories to see how they work too and what we can do with them. Yeah, poetry is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we'll, we'll be having, I think, our first uh, picture books coming up in the next year. So that's going to be as audio. So that's an exciting yeah. venture too. So yeah. How does that work? We'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Yeah. No spoilers. <laughs> well, that segues nicely into my question about genres. Um, have you found that particular categories have done well in audio? Like uh, you mentioned, you're going to focus a bit on nonfiction, um, business books. Is that because they've done really well? Do you see that growing? Um, are other fiction genres doing really well? Yeah, I would say right now that, I mean, we're such a nascent market that everything is skewed. It's what's available in Canada, kind mm -hmm. of to a certain extent, but um, looking at books, we do have the benefit of seeing what has sold historically through our US colleagues um, and what they have on offer. But yes, nonfiction is a category that's any sort of self, whether it's business, self-help, um, sort of big ideas books. Um, I, I'm, we're not gonna get away without mentioning 12 Rules for Life in the session, but 
Um, we did publish that into North America, and he read his audiobook, and that has sold obviously phenomenally well alongside the print book. The Yuval Harari, Sapiens, mm. Homo Deus, um, 21 Lesson. What's mm -hmm. that book called? It's 12 Rules, 21 Lessons. <laughs> 21 Lessons. Um, they're among, well, they are, all four of those titles are our top sellers, and then it moves sort of into actual bestsellers where we have Michael Ondaatje's Warlight, Miriam Taves' Women Talking, and um, sort of mirror the, the bigger bestsellers, too. And then a lift with things like uh, Canada Reads for the Boat People, for example, um, and Michael Brother. Redhill with The Giller. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those opportunities are, are golden more opportunities than you have audiobook resources, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a lot. Ah. <laughs> um, so we've, I mean, in our research, we've had a lot of overlap between podcast listeners and audiobook listeners for probably obvious reasons. Um, so given the popularity of true crime in the podcast space, have you thought about leveraging your very extensive crime backlist in the audiobook space? Um, we haven't looked at it forensically, so to speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I think right now our hands are full with the front list, and yeah. if we're going to publish front list true crime, then that's the moment to sort of test the waters and see if we can go backwards. Um, but yeah, I think we have three, or at least three or four in the fall, probably fairly yeah. big stories like that. Thanks. Nice. Um, so in terms of marketing audiobooks, um, do you approach the marketing of audiobooks any differently than the other formats? Um, do you use samples as a marketing tool? How does your marketing look for the audio program? Right. Well, it's, um, it's sort of a blend of both. I think everybody in this room who's got a stake in audiobooks <laughs> would agree that we have a responsibility to market the format to Canadian listeners and readers um, to try and increase the number of people listening. So there's format marketing, as we call it. We did a fairly extensive TTC campaign last year and have been using social media. Um, we now have a more focused mind in our office um, looking at audio marketing, which is great, um, and then incorporating audio as much as we can into the front list print, all format kind of publicity and marketing and trying to train people, the authors themselves, um, to mention the audio when they're out doing their media junkets, um, our publicists, everything is just to have it as integrated as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and do, do the audio samples of your books play any role in that? Well, they're available, obviously, mm -hmm. not only in the vendors, but we're working on a SoundCloud, and we are also um, you know, on our site. So there are places where people can actually hear and listen and start getting caught up in a, a book for sure, a, a, an audio book. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk a little bit about the Semi Pros podcast and if it was part of the general marketing strategy. For audio books yeah. specifically? No, it's, um, it was started as a marketing tool for our books and uh, well, for books in general um, and was on a completely parallel track to, to what we're doing. Um, seems to make so much sense. Yeah, I mean, audio or podcasts for sure have been touted as the gateway drug to audiobooks, but I think it's about habits more than necessarily. If you listen to things, you're more likely to listen to an audiobook. If, mm -hmm. you, if you read print, you're more likely to read print books. I think it's mm -hmm. more about habits necessarily. Um, so after the marketing happen in, happens, um, in terms of different strategies for maybe sales channels and the way things are, the audiobooks are actually being distributed in the market, um, do you have, or do you have on your radar different ways of approaching, say, direct downloads versus like subscription services, or the, so the physical CD part, or the library market, or is it all kind of the same thing? Um, we don't. I wouldn't say we have different approaches for the different sales channels, but we have different people who talk to the different sales channels and each of those channels have opportunities for merchandising or promotional opportunities and working together as partners and again I think it's it's in all of our interests to be working as closely with all of those channels as much as possible to bring the format forward and so people are aware of its existence and how easy it is to get, especially through libraries. 
So mostly make sure it's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's not like, you know, the old days of selling or even the new days of selling where you're making a physical face to face appointment and pitching the books. Um, you are pitching the books and what's going to be big and what's going to be eye catching on your the screen when people open up Audible or Kobo mm -hmm. and, um, and making sure that those people know what our priorities are. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, in our, in our research, we're seeing some growth in like first time listeners. So I can imagine that there's still, still a lot of experimentation in terms of how listeners are deciding to acquire audiobooks and listen to them. So, you know, trying out a subscription service or trying to stream something or getting one from the library and downloading another one. So there's probably a lot of shifting still happening in how people are deciding to listen to their audiobooks and they'll probably continue changing. Yeah, and the car, it's like, early days, yeah. like vehicles, mm -hmm. obviously, and more historically, were a primary place to listen. But now, it, but it would have been more physical. And now, cars aren't being made without, are being made without devices to listen to CDs, and so it's all digital now. So mm -hmm. yeah. I was trying to recommend an audiobook to someone who drives, and I just could not figure out how she was. I had no recommendations to like because she just wanted to take your eye device or whatever there. and plant it. And yeah. It's yeah. really easy. Yeah, make sure you just dock or it I didn't safely. say I, I meant it up in the a device. <laughs> ah, device. Bluetooth. Uh, are you uh, currently selling direct to consumer? No. Do you have any plans to? No. <laughs> when the vendors do such a good job. Mm -hmm. And in terms of people acquiring audiobooks, do you think at all about audiobook piracy hmm. and are any strategies to combat that kind of thing? Um, I have to say I don't think about it, but when it's brought to my attention, <laughs> which it has done a few times, but not a lot, actually. Um, we do have, again, it's the benefit of being part of Penguin Random House. We have a legal department we can refer everything to in the US, and they're light years ahead of anything we could do in making sure things get taken down and um, are traced pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, it's kind of expanding on off of that. Uh, you spoke a little bit about um, reach internationally, but uh, can you speak specifically to how you're approaching international sales for audiobooks? How much of a priority is that for you? Um, and how do like audio rights fit into all of that? Um, it, that question is entirely dependent on the book mm -hmm. um, and the contract that we have for that book and what rights we acquired at the time of acquisition. So. Mm -hmm. Um, usually, every all the agents, of, certainly the Canadian agents and U.S. and U.K. have been very supportive of our program. So if we acquired a book today, um, it, chances are extremely high that we will have audio as part of that. And whether we're acquiring it for Canada only or world, those audio rights would reflect mm -hmm. whatever the rights are we're offering. Or we acquire. Um, I'm just going to say I don't know if this is the right moment, but again, that our books, our audio books, our titles are available through all the vendors and through the libraries, of course. So mm -hmm. wherever we have that, those rights, it would be that sort of situation in terms of access for people in different ways. I will just jump ahead and say it answers one of your what's one of your proudest moments is um, relate kind of related to the question about rights. So a book that we published in all formats called Split Tooth by Tanya Tagak was nominated for an Audi Award um, and directing Caleb Engineering, just giving shout outs. Um, but that we could only submit that because we had North American rights for it and we were distributing that title into Canada and North America. So um, that's a, a wonderful mm -hmm. rights opportunity and we were able to submit to prizes too. Nice. Yeah, I was just reading a report out of LBF about like the um, this boom in like the Spanish language market well, yeah. in audiobooks, and I thought that was just really interesting. How there's all this opportunity for like especially backlist to start getting translated into Spanish. And, Absolutely, you know, out there. and that's a big market in the U.S. as well as mm -hmm. you know in actual South America, Spanish speaking yeah. countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, since we're running out of time, I want to make sure we talk a little bit about uh, devices and technology. So every time audiobooks come up, I feel like people talk about smart speakers. Um, are you thinking at all about incorporating that in, in terms of when you're like conceptualizing projects, in terms of making like interactive audiobook, audiobooks, or in terms of like discoverability, making sure that if someone's you know talking into their 
Alexa about like becoming by Michelle Obama, can they just like get the audiobook? So there are a couple of pieces there. Yeah, they're not. I don't think we're quite there yet, um, and we are certainly not quite there yet. Um, we're still focused on making the books themselves, um, and right now. I'm considering, as I think a lot of my colleagues are, um, that the skill um, bucket is more of a marketing opportunity now as opposed to something that can be monetized or that we can actually say, Alexa, play, becoming, and it's being bought at the same time. Uh, so um, possibly if somebody's already bought it and downloaded it, I don't have, I'm not well versed enough that it will start reading it for you, but um, um, right now the skills, I believe everybody is seeing them more as a marketing opportunity for all our books and all our formats, so. Right. Well, it's an exciting new landscape, yeah. or emerging landscape, yeah. I should say. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other things about, like, looking forward, plans for the future that you wanted to touch on before we wrap up? Um, I think just, you know, staying ahead on all of our front list titles, obviously, I think, as I mentioned earlier, expanding a bit more into our kids' program, um, but, and as you've referenced and Anne agreed, we need a few more resources, but uh, we're building, okay. yeah. <laughs> all right, very exciting. Does anyone have a question they would like to ask? Yes. Um, so with... The, so you're on top of front list, and that's amazing because some of your competitors who will go unnamed are not, <laughs> and they get very testy when we challenge them to be, so let's leave them aside. But um, <clears throat> you've got a tremendous backlist too, um, which I'm sure like, it, you don't need me telling you this, this is like, that's, that's, that's scary. Um, I imagine the arithmetic of like hours available in the studio in a given year running 24 seven doesn't make a dent in like, the new Canadian library. Like it's, it's, you know, you're 20 years before you're, you know, you know what I mean? Any thoughts about things like um, using synthetic readers to, to you know, get you 70% of the way there to, you know, cut your production time by 40, 50% or, or whatever. And any thoughts about, you know, breaking that constraint of 24 hours in a day, one studio? Sorry, can I just do that? <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, we're not 24-7 yet because we have to get people who will work there in the evening. But in general, um, I mean, those are all the questions about AI. Can you take it? You know, Siri was one woman who said a certain number of words into a microphone and never got the royalties. Uh, you know, you, everybody knows who she is, but, or at least knows the voice. So those are the kind of questions that I think will be fascinating in the future. I, I've had some really interesting conversations with, and you mentioned CNIB as well, I think, uh, this morning, that there is a lot of stuff there that, we, you know, there's a good reason it's accessible to people who need to have it in a, in a different format. Um, but um, I don't know. I don't know yet. Thanks. There's lots to think about. Thank, thank you, thank you for, thank so you. much for sharing all of that. Sorry. We can